Much of our clothing and household articles are made from cotton cloth. Cotton comes from a plant that grows on farms. The ripened or opened bowls contain seeds with white fibers attached to them. When these fibers are separated from the seeds, they can be spun into threads. Then the threads can be woven into cloth. The seeds are used in making feed for cattle and in making oils and fats for use in cooking. Cotton is grown in many parts of the world. But the United States grows more cotton than any other country. Let's look first at the southern states where most of the cotton of the United States is grown. Cotton growing is limited by temperature and rainfall. It is in this area that physical conditions are favorable to the cotton plant. To the north, it is too cool for cotton. To the south, the heavy autumn rains damage the cotton fibers. To the west, there is not enough rainfall for cotton, but it is grown there with irrigation. So this area is often called the cotton belt. Let's see how it developed. Because the trees that once covered most of the area had little money value, the early white settlers cut them down and put the land under cultivation. Plantations were developed along the rivers that flowed into the Atlantic Ocean. Here they grew rice and indigo. Farther upstream, they grew tobacco. Laborers were brought in from other parts of the world, particularly Africa. These laborers did most of the work on the plantations. Later, when Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin to separate fibers from seeds, and when other machines were developed to spin the threads and weave the cloth, the mills of Europe and the New England states paid a price for cotton fiber that encouraged the southern planter to grow it. So more land was cleared for farming, and cotton quickly became the most important crop on the plantations. The cotton belt that started in South Carolina and Georgia expanded and moved westward. The population of the new nation grew rapidly as it pushed the Indians farther west and established new states. Port cities at river mouths became larger. Charleston, Savannah, Wilmington, New Orleans, Mobile, and later Galveston. Then the railroads opened up areas not served by river boats. Where railroads met or where they crossed important rivers, other cities grew. Memphis, Atlanta, Columbia, Augusta, Macon, Columbus, Montgomery, and Jackson. All this was before the Civil War. After that war, most of the farmers were too poor to own land, so they either rented land or became sharecroppers. They grew corn and other crops to feed the mules and people, but cotton continued to be the main crop. On cultivated land, heavy rains often washed the soil away, no longer be used for crops. Worn out soils, farmers began to buy fertilizers and put them on the land. The bull weevil came from Mexico to ruin cotton crops in many years by damaging unripe bulls. Destroying the bull weevil was an added expense. Increased expenses, poor crops, and uncertain prices for their crops encouraged many farmers to leave the land and move to the towns and cities to work at other jobs. Those who stayed on the farms found they could save labor by using machines. With a tractor, one man could cultivate more ground. When these machines were used on large farms, cotton and other crops could be grown with less expense. The replacement of the mule with the tractor was an important change in farming practices. 
Also, the agricultural experiment stations aided the cotton farmer by developing kinds of plants and ways of growing them that would produce more cotton at less cost. In the southern states today, cotton is much less important than it once was. But in these areas that produce two-thirds of the South's cotton, it is still an important crop. Even so, less than half their combined farmland is in cotton. Let's visit one of the most productive of these areas, the lower Mississippi Valley. The fields are large and level permitting long straight rows that favor the extensive use of machines. After the ground has been treated with chemicals for weed control, farmers usually plant four to six rows at a time. These rows are the proper distance apart to allow for high production and machine harvesting. Flame cultivation kills weeds without harming the cotton plants, for the plants by now have become tough. Airplanes spray a chemical dust on the plants that helps to keep the boll weevil from damaging the crop. When the bowls have opened, airplanes come again to spray so that the leaves will die and drop off. This is done so that the mechanical picker will not pick the leaves with the fibers. When the basket of the picker is full, the cotton fibers are dumped into a trailer and taken to a gin. Here the fibers are separated, cleaned, and baled. Most of the large plantations have their own gins. In addition to cotton, pastures for grazing beef cattle and crops of corn and soybeans are important in this area. Mills in the towns make vegetable oils and animal feed from soybeans and cotton seeds. The towns provide many services, as well as shopping facilities, to the farmers. Here, too, are the dealers in gasoline, fuel oil, and fertilizer. On the east bank of the Mississippi River, and in the center of the Mississippi Valley cotton producing area, is that area's only large city, Memphis. It is situated on a bluff that is never flooded, and its early growth was due largely to its being a river port for shipping cotton. Cotton is still important in Memphis. Front Street has long been the center for cotton buying. Memphis is the largest inland cotton market in the world. Therefore, samples from the bales are brought here in order to determine the price. The length of the fibers must first be measured. This is done by examining the samples, sometimes by trained eyes, and sometimes by modern machines. Many people who left the cotton farms moved to Memphis to take other jobs. Some of them work in factories such as this one that makes mechanical cotton pickers. Each year, Memphis holds a cotton carnival that includes a children's parade Children from many other southern cities take part in it. Another important cotton producing area is in West Texas. Although the land is higher above sea level than many mountain ranges of the eastern states, it is usually very level. The farms of this area are also large and mechanized. Because the rainfall here is not dependable, irrigated cotton fields are very common. Wheat, which can be grown without irrigation, is a second crop. Grain sorghum is another. The rapid growth of the city of Lubbock 
has been linked with expanding cotton production in West Texas. Now, what did the southern farmers do who stopped growing cotton or who continued it only as a minor crop? Many of these farmers lived east of the Mississippi River. In the black belt of Alabama and Mississippi, once one of the leading cotton producing regions, almost no cotton can be found today. Instead, there are beef and dairy cattle. Over in Georgia and South Carolina, some cotton is still grown on small farms. On these small and sometimes hilly farms, much of the cotton is still picked by hand. In the Piedmont section of Georgia and South Carolina, which is between the mountains and the coastal plain, much of the land is uneven and sloping. To keep the heavy rainfall from washing away the soil, crops are planted on the contour and the slopes are terraced. In some places, land gullied by erosion has been smoothed by earth moving machines. Then lime was spread on the ground and grass was planted for hay and pastures. Here, the raising of livestock is more important than the growing of cotton. Keeping the land in grass helps to prevent the soil from washing away during rains. Grass also enriches the soil. Miles of peach trees can be seen in the South Carolina Piedmont, where there is located one of the most important peach producing areas in the United States. One of this country's most important areas of chicken production is in the Georgia Piedmont. Trees are now one of the most important crops in the southeastern states. More of the land here is in forests than in cultivated crops and pastures combined. Because of heavy rainfall and a long growing season, these forests grow very fast. Since forests provide timber for sawmills and pulpwood for mills that make paper and wallboard, forest industries are providing jobs for an increasing number of people. The cotton belt is becoming industrialized at a rapid rate. Many industries, like the cotton textile industry, depend upon agricultural production. For many years, the largest textile manufacturing area has been in the southeastern United States. Here, cotton is spun into thread and woven into cloth. In many parts of the cotton belt, there are new factories for rayon, nylon, orlon, and acrylon. To build new factories, office buildings, and bridges, steel is needed. Some of this steel is made in mills around Birmingham, where iron ore, coal, and limestone, all required to make steel, are found close together. A requirement for the location of industries is large amounts of available water. The rivers of the cotton belt, fed by heavy rainfall, are an important water resource. Because industries also need power to operate their machines, many rivers have been dammed in order to generate hydroelectric power. Much water from rivers is also used in the production of thermoelectric power. Oil and natural gas, other important sources of power, are carried by pipelines. Barges carry oil along water routes. Industry, commerce, rail, highway, and air transportation routes focus on cities. Dallas, one of the largest, is a financial and marketing center whose early growth was based on cotton. The oil industry has since enriched it. Dallas and Atlanta each has one million people within its metropolitan area. Atlanta started as a railroad center. It is now a center for manufacturing, distribution of wholesale goods, and retail shopping. In summary, 
a farming region that 100 years ago had but a few small cities, a region whose impoverished people were once almost entirely dependent on cotton, has, with continued cotton growing, become a region of great variety. Cotton accounts for only one-fourth of the farm income of the cotton belt today. Cotton as an irrigated crop has increased in the southwestern states. California now ranks second to Texas as a cotton producing state. People in the cotton belt live better today now that they have begun to use more wisely their resources of soil, long growing season, abundant water, forests, and minerals, changing agriculture, and growing industry. That is the cotton belt today.